I guess some of you. Yeah. yeah. Talk to him, don't talk to me. He's the guy you want to talk to. Oh, good. He is, absolutely. You can speak to my wife. Uh, good to see you this morning. My name's Craig. I'm the vicar here. Uh, and it's a joy to be with you. Uh, joy to welcome new people. Uh, we will come back for the second and uh, third time. Uh, and it's, uh, as I say, a joy to be here. Uh, we are here this morning to gather around the Lord's table uh, for our service of Holy Communion. Uh, and today we're going to be finishing up our second part of our Given series. Uh, and our fantastic Fred uh, is going to be coming and uh, leading us in our second part from Philippians 3 as we look at the gain of sacrifice. Let's do a thing that I love to do before ser service, which is just to calm our spirits, uh, just bring the chatter uh, and the catch up to a still. Uh, and let's remind ourselves that we come into the presence of God. This is a holy place. Uh, people prayed here for hundreds of years. So let's be uh, quiet and still, uh, and then we will say our prayer of preparation together. From every hill, and those who look upon him are ready. They'll never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. We say together. This Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Christ our Lord. If you're able to, please stand as we come to sing our first song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. He will deliver
generous God, a God who runs to us, who loves us, who died for us, who rose for us, and who one day will return to wipe away every tear, to help our hearts be fully of God. So we come now, Lord, with humble hearts, and we say our prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought, word, and deed, through negligence, through weakness, and through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that has passed, and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life. Almighty you God, we forgive all who truly have Wash mercy me early, and pardon me and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all things. Wisdom and the secret of life and life.
wisdom in the secret heart. The Lord is gracious and slow to anger, rich in love. in love he is good to all the lord is gracious and slow to anger rich in love he is good to all the lord is gracious slow to anger rich in Father God, we thank you for the weekly uh, news that we get in the essentials or things that are happening in this place. Lord, may we never take them for granted. May we never do them in our own strength. But may we always uh, serve this town, serve your people with meek hearts, with quiet minds, and with a perfect peace. Because we do it in your name, not ours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to have our Bible reading next, please. Uh, and then Freddie will bring us our second part of our given series. reading this morning <coughs> is taken from Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. Paul writing to the church that he had established on his second missionary tour. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast of Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider in everything a loss because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. Fred, can I pray for you, brother? Yes. 
Yes, please do. Uh, stretch out an arm if you're happy to, or a hand. <laughs> Father God, I thank you for the gift of our brother Fred. Lord, thank you for um, all that he does here. Thank you for all that he does for our town uh, as a GP. Uh, and Lord, we thank you for the way that you uh, will have been speaking uh, through him uh, and to him this week. Uh, and Lord, as he preaches, may we have ears to hear and hearts to receive what you have for us today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for having me this morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. I don't think I've preached at the, the 9.30 service for uh, possibly since I moved back to Weston, which was um, almost five years ago now. So it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I think the faith of my family uh, is really anchored in this particular service. My, my grandparents, I'm sure many of you know Joyce and Jerry Williams, um, you know, they uh, faithfully attended this service, still would if they could get here. Um, and, uh, you know, th it's their faith that has really, um, r really sustained and, and, and flown through the generations of my family. So this is a very special service for me, and it's a pleasure to be here worshipping with you this morning. Um, so the subject of our title today, or the subject of our talk today, the title is The Gain of Freedom. What we get, sorry, the gain of sacrifice, what we gain when we give something up, the freedom that we gain when we give something up. So right at the start of this talk, I want us to start by grasping this principle. When we sacrifice something, we gain freedom from it. I think that's quite a counterintuitive thing for us to think about. It, it feels wrong that if you sacrifice something, you, you gain from it. But uh, really, it is true. When we sacrifice something, we gain freedom from that thing. I'm going to try to illustrate this uh, or with an example, okay. Um, so when I was at university in my second year, I shared a house with four other guys. One of the guys would steal everyone's food out of the fridge. He wouldn't admit to it, but whatever you had in there, it would go missing, and there was only one person who had been eating it. And he, he, we'd moved in together um, at the start of our second year, and by the November, things were coming to a head. And I'd been training, uh, doing some rugby training. It was a Monday night. It was dark. It was cold. You know, one of those November nights where you really start to feel winter draw in. And uh, I got back from rugby training, very tired, very miserable. And uh, Jack, the guy that used to steal the food, had taken all the vegetables that I'd been looking forward to in my stir fry. You know, the only thing that had been getting me through that rugby training was the thought of a nice hot meal when I got back home. And all I was left with for my stir fry was some chicken and some noodles, uh, which was a fairly dull stir fry. And, um, and it <laughs> He wouldn't admit to taking them, but he'd been the only one in the house, and they were there before we'd left. So uh, things really came to a head at that point. And the next day, um, one of the other guys and I, we were at home alone. The other two were out. Um, we, we, we had a second fridge in our living room that the landlady had given us. She'd never turned it on, or we'd never turned it on, because we fitted all of the food we needed in the one fridge. And being students, we wanted to save money. But we had this idea, let's put all of our food in, in the secret fridge, turn it on and don't tell Jack who steals food, and then he won't be able to steal our food. And that, wor that worked fine, that worked fine, until Cal got home. Cal was the third guy in the house who didn't steal food, and he wanted to hit, put his food in the secret fridge as well. And we said, no, Cal, you can't do that, because then there won't be any food in the normal fridge, and then Jack will realise something is up, and he'll find our secret fridge, and he'll steal our food again. So I did something terrible, and do you know, I'm ashamed of it to this day, we, we, we threw Cal under the bus, we sacrificed Cal, and we gained freedom from Jack. You see, sacrifice gives us freedom. I, Cal did forgive me, I was best man at his wedding a couple of years ago, but it was, that was an awful thing that we did. But I think, I think maybe there are better examples, more virtuous examples. When, when we give up cigarettes, you know, we gain freedom from addiction. So sacrifice in that situation gives freedom. Um, and th there are more subtle ways too. Think of Roger Federer. Um, here's, here's a tennis player. I don't think there's ever been a tennis player who looked so graceful and so effortless playing the game of tennis. You know, th that man, it, it, he was beautiful to watch. It was poetry in motion. How did he gain such freedom on the tennis court? 
It was through sacrifice, hours and hours, days and days, you know, probably as an infant, as a child, as a teenager, and then into his professional career, sacrificing day after day, persevering, enduring, practicing hard, hard, probably harder than anyone else, and so that he can play in his professional career and make the game of tennis look so easy and so beautiful. His sacrifice gave him freedom. So Paul in our passage today is boasting in the freedom that he has in Christ. He says he considers all things rubbish when he compares them to the amazing worth of knowing Christ and being found in him. He is free from the grip the world held over him. You know, as a man who lived a life as a devout, God-fearing Jew, he's saying none of that compares to knowing Christ. How has he gained such freedom? Well, actually, what he's saying is he had to give up all that he built as a devout, God-fearing Jew. If we just rewind a bit and think about the broader context of the passage. So Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. They're a faithful and flourishing church, but they are in danger of making a mistake. And in our passage, Paul is, Paul is warning them against making that mistake. They were being disturbed by uh, teachers who were advising the newly, newly converted Christians, people who weren't previously Jews, they were advising those, those non-Jewish Christians that they needed to practice more traditional Jewish faith. Specifically, they were warning that those, those non-Christian Jews should be circumcised. I think it's, when we think of the early church, it's often tempting to, to take all of the traditions and all of the things that we do and sort of assume that we've always been doing that for the last 2,000 years. But actually, if you think back, the early, the early church was looking for its identity. You know, the disciples met the resurrected Christ. They gained the gift of the Holy Spirit and they took the good news out. But they mainly took it out into Jerusalem and Israel. So for, for the first few years of the early church, it was a revolutionary Jewish sect. It was a new understanding of the Jewish faith, the faith and a renewing of Judaism from the inside. And then Paul comes along and he takes this revolutionary Jewish sect and he takes it to the Roman world and specifically to non-Jews. And these non-Jews start to become followers of Christ. They start to become Christians. And, and that's where this conflict comes up. How, how far do these non-Jewish Christians need to follow traditional Jewish practice? Paul talks in the passage about mutilators of the flesh. He means preachers who are saying that non-Jewish Christians needed to be circumcised because, of course, all the Jewish men were circumcised and these new non-Jewish Christians were joining a revolutionary Jewish sect. So, of course, it makes sense if they're joining a Jewish sect, they should be circumcised like the other Jews. But what Paul says is we are the true circumcision. What he's getting at is that these new converts don't need to have an outward sign of their devotion to God because of uh, their life in Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say that having been the most devout of Jews, the most upright of Jews, a, a Jewish man who had everything in his traditional Jewish community, he gave it all up in the name of Christ. Now, we're actually not going to get too bogged down in this sort of Jewish traditional practice versus non-Jewish non Christian practice debate. Um, what, we, what we want to draw out here is the truth underpinning Paul's arguments, and that is that he had given up so much for Christ and yet gained so much more. So we're going to think about the gain of sacrifice um, that Paul is, is talking about here in two key ways. First of all, we're going to think about the gain of sacrifice as, as we give up of our will, as we submit to Christ. And then we're going to briefly think about what that means in terms of giving of, uh, of our finances. So let's start by thinking about will. When we give up of our will, um, we submit. Now, I think the term submission gets a bad reputation in our culture. Um, you know, when you think of submission, you, th you think of um, a persecuted minority submitting to an overbearing government. Uh, you, you think of, you know, a, a downtrodden minority um, who, who are being forced onto their knees. Submission is generally considered to be a bad thing. You know, we let someone have power over us, that we let someone curtail our freedom, and so when we submit, it is inherently bad. 
Personally, I, I don't have a huge problem with submission. Uh, many of you may know that I'm, I'm married to my wife. We'll be married eight years in September. And um, thank you, yeah. I think the real applause there is that I remembered how many years it's been. Um, so getting married, eight years in September. And, and as I've been married now for eight years, I've learned a lot about mutual submission. Um, you know, let me give you some examples. For, you know, for instance, Becky and I should be looking at, um, at my, uh, perhaps my profile picture on Facebook. And she said, um, Freddie, why don't you change that to a nice one of the two of us? And I say, well, I like the profile picture I've got. Uh, it's a nice photo from my, from my holiday with my friends. Uh, and, and, of course, we think about it and then... We changed my profile picture. Um, or perhaps we're cooking dinner, and I, I say, what, Becky says, what would you like for dinner? I say, oh, I'd, like I'd like a pepperoni pizza. I love pizza. And Becky said, hmm, I quite like some vegetables. And so we think about it, and um, then we have vegetables instead. So, you know, I say what I want, Becky says what she wants, and then we do what Becky wants. And it's all, it's all mutual. Now, I'm being naughty. She's not here, so I can get away with this. But I, I still think, you know, we, we do submit to each other in different ways. But submission has a bad reputation in our culture. Do you know, in our culture, I think words like self-fulfillment and freedom, they're much more attractive to our ears than the words of Christ when he said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know, those words are a command to submit, to deny ourselves, and to live a cross-shaped life. I think those are scary words to hear. They're such hard words to live. But that's what Jesus calls, to, and calls us to. And, and the thing is, Jesus, Jesus didn't just die a death of submission. He lived a life of submission. You know, he was the suffering servant. He, he flatly rejected notions of power and authority. He told his disciples, you are not to be called rabbi, neither be called master. Jesus shattered the customs of his day when he took women and children seriously. You know, he is the, the man who got on his knees and washed the feet of his disciples. The, the master taking the role of the lowliest servant or slave even. This is the Jesus who could have called down a legion of angels to utterly destroy the Roman soldiers who were torturing him and stringing him up on that cross. But instead, he chose to submit to them. He chose to endure that humiliation and that persecution. You know, and that is ultimate submission, when we hold all of the power, when we hold all of the authority, and yet we still choose to do the will of another. Paul echoed that cross-shaped life in our passage. He says, For the sake of Christ Jesus my Lord, I have lost all things. And then he goes on, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation of his sufferings, becoming like him in death. You know, he's saying, I've absolutely submitted my will to Christ. I've absolutely submitted my life to Christ. I've given up all things for Christ, and now I am prepared even to suffer in death as Christ suffered. I think it's the great paradox at the heart of the Christian faith that the gift of salvation is totally free and totally undeserved. You know, we, we, we do nothing to gain eternal life and a, and a relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. And yet, as we truly grasp the message of Christ, as we truly come to understand what, what he asks of us, as we let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts, actually that message comes to cost us everything. We take up our cross and we follow Christ. We give of ourselves and we submit to his will with our whole lives. And yet, if you ask any Christian... Is it worth it? Anyone who's lived that cross-shaped life, they will reply in absolute terms with such joy, with such peace, that the freedom they gain in Christ means that everything they held before they, before they were a Christian is as nothing compared to knowing Christ. So that's our will. Now, I just briefly want to think about money very quickly. And I know Paul isn't talking explicitly about money in our passage, but I'm going to try to explain why I think it's quite relevant and why there's actually a principle here beyond money that is important for us to understand as a congregation. 
So Paul is telling us, he's at pains to point out that he was uh, the Hebrew of Hebrews. He was, he had everything from a Jewish perspective, you know, circumcised on the eighth day from a respectable tribe. He was righteous. You know, he didn't commit any sin to break the law. You know, he was known for his zeal because he persecuted the Christians. He had such a reputation, such a position amongst the Jewish community. You know, he knew the law better than any priest. He had it all. And he's saying, I I had everything. I was fantastic. I think when we hear that with our cultural ears on, we're a bit nonplussed. You know, we say, do you know what? That's great, Paul. I'm so glad for you. But if I was perhaps a Christian, uh, uh, you know, living in the first century, I'm not sure I would have spent all of my time building up my sort of Jewish credentials in the same way. Uh, And I think that's because as a culture... We don't, look, we don't look to gain achievement, respectability, notability. Um, we don't gain all that through our religious achievement in the same way. We don't gain all that for our position in the community in the same way. Actually, in our culture, so often the way people look to gain status, the way people look to, to, to show where they are in the world and what they've achieved, it's through money and through wealth and through possessions. So I think when Paul boasts in this way of what a great Jew he once was and how much he once held, it's almost like Bill Gates saying to us, do you know what? Everything I've earned is as nothing compared with knowing Christ. The difference being Paul is boasting for one reason. He's saying, I've gained such freedom because I gave all that up. Actually, all of that is as nothing compared to knowing Christ because of the most amazing gift I've been given as I've sacrificed for him. So actually, it's like Bill Gates giving away all of his money, giving away his companies, giving away everything that, that earns him anything, his houses, his wealth, his prosperity, impoverishing himself completely and then saying all of that was worth nothing compared to knowing Christ. So Paul isn't talking explicitly about money, but he's talking about giving up the thing which is most precious to him. And this is, this is the truth, I think, for us to draw out here. Bring us back to submitting our will to Christ. It's not that we have to impoverish ourselves completely and give up everything in the way that Paul did, or, or perhaps I was sort of hypothesizing Bill Gates does. But so often in our lives, um, things come between us and God. Things, things that we hold on to um, tightly that stop us fully living that cross-shaped life. So often in our culture, it is money. I think this congregation, I know, gives very faithfully um, in a way that blesses the work of the church and allows the church to do so much. So perhaps for, for this congregation, money is not uh, that thing that we hold on to tightly. But I think the challenge for us to draw out here is what is it that we hold on to that that blocks us from living a cross-shaped life? What is it that we can sacrifice in order to gain the freedom that comes when we give something up, in order that we can follow Christ more closely, that we can take up that cross and follow him more meaningfully, in order that we can know Christ more? What is it? How can we serve? How can we give of ourselves? How can perhaps we give of our money in a way that allows us to know Christ better, to gain that freedom more, to step into that great joy and peace which Paul is speaking from in our passage. So as we close now, I would just love for us to think about that. You know, Paul tells us in our passage, he has given up so much. He's given up everything and yet... It was all as nothing compared to what he has now. He, 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 he had such a position of authority and power, and yet he humbled himself completely and is all the better for it. Jesus asks us to take up our cross and follow him. And as we close now, let's just, let me just pray for us and ask the Lord if there is anything that he would encourage us to do, anything he would encourage us um, to, to give, that we may serve him more and know him more. Yes, Lord Jesus, thank you that you were the suffering servant. Thank you, Lord, for the gift you have given us and the way that you meet with us. Thank you, Lord, for this congregation, this group, who, who have given for so long, so faithfully, of their time, their energy, 
their finances. And thank you, Lord, um, for the way they serve this church and continue to serve this church. Holy Spirit, we just ask you now as we consider Paul's words in this passage. We ask you that we may know your joy more. We ask you that we may know your peace more. We ask you that we may know that freedom that Paul boasts in, the freedom of sacrifice. And Lord, if there are things that we can give, if there are ways that you want us to serve more, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear your voice and give us the strength to follow you more faithfully. Amen. Thank you, sir. Heather is going to come and uh, lead us in our church intercessions next, please. Let us pray for the world, our church, and God's people. God of love and Father of us all, we know that sin always leads to suffering. Have mercy on those who are suffering in our world today as a result of war and civil strife. The wounded and handicapped, the dying and bereaved, the homeless and impoverished, the starving and refugees. Bless the agents of righteousness and reconciliation at work among the stricken nations and give peace in our time. We think particularly of the wars in Gaza and Ukraine and the escalations with Iran overnight. We pray for all those who have been affected, whether by loss of life or loss of shelter. We also pray today for the families of those killed in Sydney yesterday. Father, give them comfort and peace in these terrible circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, Sovereign Lord, we pray for our church and the work here at St. Paul's. We thank you for the people you have sent here, for Craig and Sam and their families. May they be refreshed from their holiday and continue to trust in your vision for this place and lead with strength, love and understanding. For the other members of the staff team and the volunteers, we thank you for their enthusiasm and dedication to their roles. May they continue to love and serve you through their work here. As a church who looks to serve those in the local area, we ask that you will put on our hearts those you wish us to reach out to. We thank you for our children and young people, for those who come to groups during the week who are seeking help, companionship or comfort. We pray too for those in our small groups who worship, study and pray together. Lord, we thank you for all our groups and for those who run them. We pray that you will send others to join us as we put roots down to become stronger in you. Knock walls down to make way for people to come in and build bridges out to mend those relationships that might be broken. Lord, help us to focus our prayers and our resources to meet the needs of those we encounter and who are seeking you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Compassionate Lord, we come to you this morning in many different states. Some of us are feeling weary, some unwell, others still anxious and afraid. There are those of us who have lost loved ones and others who have loved ones who are sick. Father, we ask for comfort and peace for each person who is hurting. Help us to understand that you are with us through the hurting. Loving Father, we thank you that you rejoice with us when we are celebrating. Today there are people here celebrating maybe the birth of a baby, the beginning of a relationship, the su success of an exam or something at work. Thank you that you are with us in the joyful moments as well as the sorrowful ones. Precious Lord, help us as we seek a closer relationship with you, even if it means making sacrifices. Help us to be faithful and true and to listen to your voice so that we may do your will 
here in St. Paul's and in the town of Western Supermare. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Heather. If you're able to stand, please do as we come to the peace. Sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of God's peace. As we continue to share the peace with one another, let's sing our next song, uh, Knowing You.
Father God, we thank you that you love us so much so you sent your Son to die for us and to rise for us. So Lord, as we gather around this table, may we always be mindful that it's you who invites. It's you who steps closer to us. It's you who bled for us. It's you who redeem us. Thank you. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and you love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, love and Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his commands, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he, had, on the night before he died, he had supper with his friends. And taking bread, he praised you. Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross and bring him before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us into your loving arms and bring us of all the saints to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour, 
and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. We say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Sisters and brothers, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shared for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. We come now to our time of distribution. If those who are helping me uh, to distribute could come forward. Uh, we have chapel prayer. Please do come and receive chapel prayer. Uh, and I think you probably know the drill by now. Do you know the drill, how we do communion? You do, don't you? Intinction to the side, common cup in the middle, hands out. If you don't want to receive, come and get a blessing. Any other questions, ask me afterwards. We'll keep it short. Okay? <laughs> Have we got a Liz? There she is. Fabulous.
Let's give thanks for the meal that our Lord has provided for us in the prayer of thanksgiving. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you're able to, please stand as we come to sing our final song, Majesty, Worship His Majesty. Majesty, worship His Majesty, unto Jesus. I must say thank you uh, to our worship band who stepped in last minute. Can we give Claire a massive thank you and the team? It's been a total joy, I imagine, leading worship this morning. If you don't see her ever again, you know why. But not all, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I believe there's some happy birthdays in the house. So um, if, um, who, who's birth, is it Greg's birthday? Coming up and, yeah, is it today? How, ni- how old? I should, 89. All right, whoever's near him, 89 bumps. And I believe there's another birthday coming up on Tuesday. Yeah, how old? 90? Spring chicken. Fabulous. Well, let's go with God's blessing. Sisters and brothers, the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Do stick around for tea and coffee. Goodbye and God bless.